We made a lot of power on the dyno with the sledgehammer, but we're gonna make more. So rather than do this as a typical talking hands video like I do on that hot mess of a desk behind me, since I'm at the big computer today, we're going to be looking at all kinds of data and, you know, graphs and compressor maps and stuff. I figured I'd pull a bit of a Richard Holdner and, you know, do it here. And I got better hair. Sorry, Richard. Let's start with the 800 pound gorilla in the corner of the room, and that is the torque converter slip, especially since there were a bunch of comments saying that, hey, I thought a power glide's loss was only 15%. Well, that's true as far as turning the pump, turning the gears, turning the clutch packs, the drum, all that stuff is concerned, but it doesn't take into account the losses in the torque converter. And actually, historically speaking, I know because I have had this thing on the dyno for like 20 years. In fact, I've dug up my first ever dyno sheet with this car. It's dated February 10th, 2002. And it made a whopping 320 rear wheel horsepower and like 353 foot pounds of torque. And that was a, with a little M90 Eaton supercharger off a of Super Coupe, huffing like four or five PSI into a 306 stock block engine through an AOD and blah, 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 blah. How far we've come, we're now making more than that on motor through a glide, which doesn't have lockup. But looking at our dyno graph, there was a lot more slip. And I went through this in the end of the dyno video. I'm not going to go through it here again just because it's going to take up a lot of time. But I ran the numbers. And actually, I can do that because here we can plot against engine RPM, but we can also plot against actual speed, like mile an hour. And we know the rear gear is a 308. We know we pulled it in high gear, which is a one-to-one. -one. And you know we know the tire height and all that jazz. So we can actually calculate the slip through the converter. And it's actually a bit high. It's about 8.6% naturally aspirated and about like 13.2% with the sledgehammer running. So that's a lot of slip. And that's why we were blowing through the converter, by the way. So that's a difference of like four and a half percent. It's pretty significant. Now, I don't expect us to ever be able to match the naturally aspirated lack of slip with the boosted slip because, well, it's just simply more power, and it's a lot more power. It's, you know, we're starting to sneak up on 50% more power, as a matter of fact. Uh, so it's always going to slip a little bit more, but there are some things that we can do to fix that issue. For one, we drove the thing 100 miles to Ray's place. It's, it's like pretty much exactly 100 miles from my house to Ray's dyno, and we drove the whole way nonstop, and we immediately pulled it onto the dyno and strapped it down and started doing pulls. We did like eight pulls in four hours. And while there was a fan in front of the radiator, like you saw in the video, obviously, it really blew at the radiator and blew over the engine and very little airflow went under the car, which obviously is where the transmission pan is. And the headers are pretty darn close to that transmission pan. So what was going on was basically the fluid was like cooking itself because the heat had nowhere to go. And I don't have a trans temp gauge in the car. I actually ordered one. It'll be here soon enough because I do think that is an important variable for us to address in the future. Uh, you know, we didn't have that here. So this part is a bit supposition. You know, I did talk to my converter guy who is Neil Knight at BTE. Uh, BTE, like, have done a lot of power glide stuff. And, uh, you know, Neil built this converter because he knew I was doing dumb things with it. In other words, you know, uh, 308 rear gears with a Whipple, leaving off a trans brake at full boost. In fact, he told me not to do it, even though the thing's got, you know, massive uh, anti-balloon plates on the front and a billet steel back. It's a 10-inch converter. It's designed to be indestructible. It has a steel C-stator for, for those of you who are into converters, but it really is a pretty robust unit. But now he can make a nine and a half inch that he says is gonna be a little bit more efficient and do a little bit of a better job at coupling. However, that's pretty expensive, so that's pretty far down the list. Plus, until I actually get a proper lift, which, you know, hopefully is coming fairly soon and a bigger space but that's a story for another time but at the moment it's a little difficult for me to do that in my tiny garage on quick jack so that's not really a huge like push to do that but there are things we can do and that is just improve the cooling and don't drive a hundred miles and then strap it to a dyno for four hours i mean that certainly didn't help but anyway, so that, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. That is now out of the way. So now let's move on to the big thing that we are definitely doing, and that is meth injection, specifically pre-compressor meth injection. Now I know I have a video that actually did rack up a bunch of views a few years ago with uh, sort of an Anderson Mr. Freeze type of thing, which is a passive meth injection, which uses boost pressure to push the meth 
through a nozzle before the compressor. And that was designed to work with the Whipple. I never put it on because I, you know, ended up going with this wacky air to water intercooler and just didn't need it. And it's not really going to work here because it's not a fine enough mist. We're only seeing what's like six PSI of boost anyway. It's, it's not, it's not enough to atomize it. And that, that could actually over a period of time damage the impeller in the compressor, which I don't want to do that obviously. Uh, so it will be a, a more standard pump based injection system, but the advantages of doing pre-compressor are kind of huge. Let's take a look here at the compressor map. And by the way, it's going to be really frightening like how close the compressor maps and all the data matches what we actually saw. So we actually saw, if we go back to the dynograph real quick, a peak of 532 rear wheel horsepower, again with an SAE correction. Now on the compressor map, and this compressor map is pretty close to our actual compressor map, but our map should be just a little bit better because we are running a billet impeller, uh, which is lighter, has a smaller diameter center section. Uh, you know, it, it's got extended tips. It's, it's just a better unit, which should result in a little bit more power. But let's just base it purely on this because, again, it's frighteningly close. So with converter slip figured into the math here, we're right around 720 flywheel horsepower at about a pressure ratio of 1.41, which lands us squarely right here on the compressor map. And that means that the compressor should be spinning right around 31,500 to 32,000 RPM. And guess what? That's exactly how fast it was spinning based on the data log from the ESC. But that's pretty scary, isn't it? Like, it actually works as it should. You know, we could probably even tweak this a little bit better. But, I mean, it's like right spot on. And, by the way, I'm getting to the 720 uh, flywheel horsepower number with a brake-specific fuel calculation based on the data log from the EFI in the car. But all these numbers just happen to line up magically. So that really translates to roughly 545-ish, maybe pushing 550 at the wheels, if we could take care of the converter slip issue anyway. But let's see what meth injection would do. So what meth injection would do, besides all the good stuff, you know, the increased octane, the lowered IATs, if we specifically spray it pre-compressor, there now has been a ton of data that shows that you are effectively moving the compressor map to the right. And what I mean by that is if you look at these RPM lines, so, so this arc here is 30,000 RPM, this arc here is 35,000 impeller RPM, and we're playing right where we should be, which is right around 32,000 impeller RPM. But if you notice, the lines start to walk off a cliff. And that is because the compressor is going into choke. It simply doesn't have enough back pressure for the airflow that it's moving and that's called choke so the drive power like starts to shoot up which is why these lines kind of start to go down so we are in the beginning of the choke region now if we could just kind of slide this whole map over to the right then we're going to be playing in a happier spot of the arc here and that means that we're going to see lesser load higher rpm which is all a win so that that translates to more boost more airflow and less load on the motor. I mean, that's that's the theory anyway. And, you know, Garrett and some other turbocharging companies have verified this. You know, as far as, by the way, really interestingly speaking, uh, Volvo actually conducted pre-turbo meth injection wear tests. And they found that you have to drive about 80,000 to 100,000 miles before a methanol injection wears the turbo enough to need to replace it. <laughs> and that, that ain't happening. You know, come on. Us racers, yeah, we, we blow things up. And one last point about meth injection. I really don't want to run uh, an intercooler like an air-to-air -air or air-to-water. First of all, air-to-air -air would be a plumbing issue and it adds weight to the front and restricts airflow and all that. Uh, air-to-water is, is fairly complex. You're taking ice with you to the track and there's just no need. We're just not running that much boost. And another downside with a more traditional intercooler is that you always lose some boost. And we're, let's face it, running fairly low boost for, for huge results, but, but fairly low boost numbers nonetheless. I don't want to give any of that up. So that's it. So the next relatively easy thing that we can do is the motor timing. Now the motor timing, when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about the engine timing, but the concept is very similar. I'm talking about the motor timing in the brushless motor that drives the sledgehammer. And the effects are very similar. So if this is your case where the coils are around in the motor, right? Where the different phases are, and you have a rotor inside and you have a rotor inside 
the when the rotor let's say my knuckle up here is one of the phases right so if you have the phase trigger exactly when the rotor coincides with that particular coil it's not going to move in fact it's going to lock it in place so you want that to fire before the rotor gets to that point right and just like an engine realistically you don't want fixed timing but you know the way this esc works it actually is kind of more or less fixed as far as i understand it anyway so we're running 15 degrees of advance so if 15 degrees is here as the, this pole spins around in the rotor and it gets to the 15 degree point that's when this here phase actually fires and it pulls the rotor to that phase and then that phase shuts off and then it fires the next phase 15 degrees before our rotor pole gets there yeah i did that apparently that is the thing on youtube now but what's the point of me talking about this well this motor is rated to make peak power at 15 degrees of timing at 50,000 rpm we're not hitting 50,000 rpm we're hitting like two-thirds of that so maybe at two-thirds of the rpm we need two-thirds of timing to optimize it that's something that we need to test and i actually do want to test it less motor timing actually has another advantage and that is it makes the brushless motor more efficient so that means there's less heat there's less current draw which means less voltage drop which means more rpm so that's it's kind of a win on every conceivable level now the first thing that's in the category of harder stuff really isn't that much harder but it is kind of a pain and i don't know if it's really worth doing we're seeing about four volts drop in the cables that's really not that much i mean it, it's it, it is significant but it is a bit of a hassle to deal with as far as you know making the cables bigger going from four gauge to say two gauge for the motor cables and the cables from the actual esc to the battery packs themselves they're pretty short already and there's like less than four tenths of a volt voltage drop in those cables but the one thing we can do to minimize the voltage drop that would have a significant effect and is doable is we could run another set of cells in parallel visual aid time so these are the cells that i'm running right now it's i believe 26 of these guys in series and each one of them is carrying 700 amps which is pretty amazing now i have more than enough of these to do a second set in parallel with the first set which means that the voltage drop that we're seeing through the batteries right now is about seven volts that means that that voltage drop would get cut in half that'd be three and a half volts and we are currently seeing about 615 kv which means 615 rpm per volt and you know we can triple that well actually a little bit more than triple that uh that would be another 2000 rpm and if we look at the compressor map, another 2000 RPM is definitely significant. So this is one thing that may actually be worth doing, but again, it's gonna be more current draw, more power to the motor. And the ESC has a continuous rating of 800 amps. We'll have to play with the timing first and see if we can get that 700, 675, 700 amp current draw down a little bit, just so I feel comfortable before we do this. So then the big one. We could just simply switch over to a different compressor uh specifically here another visual aid so this is the original impeller that came with the vortex that we're using right now this is actually an sc trim and you can see that the the fins are actually milled down they're clipped and that's because the point of an sc trim was to be put on mod motors and stuff where they you know spin a pretty high rpm and that would allow the the blower itself to survive at higher rpm but it's exactly the opposite of what we want so this was not the right impeller which is why i went to an si trim unit now in order to actually improve the islands even further you want a larger exducer an exducer again is the outside here right this is the inducer this diameter from here to here it's what you typically see in a turbo if you're staring down the barrel of a turbo uh but the that's so that's inducer this is exducer we don't really need a whole lot more inducer than what we have but we could use more exducer and one way to achieve that would be to step it up to a Vortec JT trim. Let's look at the compressor maps. So once again, we are screwing around right around here in this uh, Vortec SI trim compressor map. Again, it's frighteningly accurate. And keep in mind that we are in the beginning of the choke region of this compressor map. However, if we look at the JT trims compressor map, it tells a bit of a different story. So we would be right about on this vertical axis and playing around right here so you can tell it would take a little bit more rpm but it's like a few hundred rpm 
but we are in a much happier place in terms of staying away from the choke region, which means it takes less power to drive it here which means we would see more RPM, which means we would see more horsepower, and we're still staying away from the, uh, from the choke region of the compressor map. So that too is a win on every level. But in reality, that is, A, I'd have to find one. If, if, if you've got one, you know, hit me up, put it in the comments or, you know, get a hold of me. But, you know, I want to optimize what we've already got because it works really well. And the meth, again, should help shift the whole compressor map to the right. I'm 100% certain that we're going to hit the 800 to 850 flywheel horsepower goal pretty easily. In fact, here's a dirty little secret. We take it on a mineshaft air day to the track. Guess what? We're already there. So those are all my thoughts for what I was thinking about doing for more power. If you have any ideas, please, you know, post them in the comments down below. And I want to thank all of you watching these videos. It's because of you that I'm pushing this as far. If it wasn't for your support and your motivation and your involvement, I probably wouldn't be going to these extremes with this. So thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who subscribed. Definitely post comments. Give me your ideas. Give me thumbs up. That's always really helpful for the algorithm, you know, so we can continue developing this thing even further. And guess what? I'm also getting ready to take it to the track. So hopefully the weather holds out. It doesn't get too hot. I don't want to wait till the fall to do some drag strip testing. So we're going to try to get there as soon as possible. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and I'll catch you all in the next one. It's getting hot. It's hot. Take care of it.